say this real quickly. We're going to jump into this, and we're going to circle back around to a couple points last week that I want to make sure you got. And if you didn't watch last week, I'm, I'm strongly encouraging you to go back. Um, and I say this not because I get any kind of, you know, we don't get any kind of bonus for you going back and watching, but I believe last week there was such a powerful spirit of revelation, especially when it came to um, repentance. And um, we're talking about repentance, but there's two words here. And again, like I said, this is another whiteboard Sunday, so we're going to use some uh, whiteboard uh, wording. And as always, my goal is to not misspell a word, even though I think I did misspell one last week. But again, working on my humility. But there was two major words that came out of last week, and I really want you to remember those because they are important. We're going to another set today, but these are very important, and that is fruit. And what I mean by fruit is... We talked about this last week when it came to conviction and um, uh, condemnation. The fruit of the thought determines its origin. And we talked about how do we know the difference between conviction and, um, and, and um, condemnation. And one of the easiest ways to determine the difference between conviction and condemnation is by the fruit, right? Fruit of conviction is hope drawing us closer to God. It is pointing out our sin, but it's also pointing it out with a desire to change. Whereas condemnation brings fruit of hopelessness. I'll never get it right. I'll never be any good. It brings shame. It brings a, a desire to remove ourselves, to hide away because we feel like there is no hope for us. And so the fruit determines that. But I'm also, there's another challenge here, and I say this, that the fruit of the interpretation determines whether or not you are interpreting the scripture correctly. And what I mean by that is, is that there are things in the Bible that are very strong. There are some things in the Bible that, from one standpoint, are not easy on our flesh. There are things in the Bible that you read and you don't like them in your flesh, but your spirit says yes. Your inner man is strengthened by them. The Bible talks about things that we shouldn't do. The Bible talks about things we should avoid. There are talks about character and characteristics that we should have that are not in alignment with today's worldly values. And yes, when we read these things, um, we don't like them in our flesh. They're, con they're, con they're, they're contrary to our flesh, as Paul says. But our spirit says yes. But there are some things when we interpret it, it brings a hopelessness. It brings a heaviness. It brings a weight. It brings a burden to us. And I challenge you today, instead of taking that and going, wow, the Bible really is a heavy book. The Bible is unfair. The Bible is overwhelming. Maybe it's not the Bible that's the problem. Maybe it's your interpretation because the fruit of the word of God brings life and hope and peace. Now, it doesn't mean, again, I'm not suggesting that there's not things in the word of God that are hard on our flesh. The Bible is very clear on that. And we're going to get this to this maybe the next week or the week after. I mean, the Bible talks about denying yourself. Uh, that's, a, that's, that's not a cookie cutter, pat on the back, hey, don't worry about it. That is... You're going to have to say no to things in your life. You're going to have to say no to some pleasures. You're going to have to say no to some ambitions that are a part of that. But fruit is a big determining factor. In fact, the Bible says we should be known by our fruit. Now, for you Pentecostals who been around for a while, we've often determined fruit as how many people you brought to God and how many people have gotten baptized and filled the Holy Ghost. And that's not what really fruit is talking about at all. The fruit is talking about is, is the fruit of the Spirit, character, conduct attitude. You can bring a thousand people to church and be a rotten human being and be lost. Paul said, woe be it to me if I preach the gospel and find myself a castaway. So again, fruit determines this. And what I'm going to show you today is that there may be some interpretations of scriptures that we've gotten wrong. And at first glance, you're going to go, oh, I don't really like the way that is. I like it the other way. But if you would let God speak into your spirit, you're going to find there's more hope in that than there actually is in the interpretation we get. But there's some others. The, listen, the Bible has become the ultimate weapon. People can use the Bible and manipulate scriptures in the Bible, and it's the ultimate weapon. And that weapon produces condemnation and fear and oppression. You've dealt with it. I've dealt with it. We know what it's like. Religion and the Bible combined together produces oppression. It produces fear. It produces frustration. It produces hopelessness. It's not the Bible's problem. The Bible is, and it, the Bible is the word of God. It, it, is, it is God. Remember John, in the beginning it was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. The word became flesh. So the Bible's not the problem, it's our interpretation. So point number one and point number two, again, repentance 
And we talked about this, and this was sort of the, the, the opening salvo into this Lost in Translation that we're end up doing. And I didn't mean to make it into sort of this mini-series, but God had other intentions. Um, and that is, repentance is more than just changing. We often think of repentance as, I just need to change. But remember, repentance is not really necessarily change, even though, yes, that is part one of repentance. Part one of repentance is change. The most important part of repentance is to turn to something. We talked about this last week. The reason why we struggle with fully living in a repentant lifestyle is because we're trying to change our minds. But in changing our minds, we're really not turning to. Yes, I need to change my mind. I had to realize that my thought problems, the way I think, the way I've conducted is wrong. But that's only the part. That's the acknowledgement. The action is turning to something. And as I turn from something, I'm actually turning to or as the Hebrew word connotates, returning to something. Remember, it's God's desire to get us back into communion and back into communication that we had in the garden with him. Remember, sin took away communication between man and God, and God's been desiring from that very beginning by his blood and through forgiveness of sin to bring us back into communication. So as you are struggling with things in your life and you're trying to overcome those and you're desperately trying to change and you tell yourself in the mirror every day, I will never do this again. And you find yourself repeating those actions instead of getting frustrated and quitting and say, it's never going to work. The problem is you are doing something right. You are acknowledging there needs to be change, but simply acknowledging change or attempting to change is not the full picture. You need to turn to something or return to something. And that's what we talked about last week, that the greatest power for repentance is not the change of mind, but it's the turning to or the returning to Jesus Christ. And now why is that important? Because we talked about it last week, is that we're, we don't live in a square world anymore. We, we don't live in a, a beautifully defined edged world where you can simply live all your life in a box. We live in a very... Uh, changing, rapidly changing, ever-changing world where everything is being redefined on a daily basis. And if you don't have Christ as the center of your life, when you get off course, you have nothing to come back to. He has our anchor point that is stable in the middle of chaos because our world is always changing. It's redefining what's good. What was good today is bad tomorrow. What was bad today is good tomorrow. And if you're trying to find a way to square off your ever-changing world, and some do that. Some prefer a very neatly tight, squared world. And some even try to use the Bible to produce that. The problem is the Bible is not always black and white. And for those of you out there that want to make the Bible always black and white, you're wrong because the Bible has a lot of things in there that are not spelled out in today's world. Well, the Bible says, you know, the Bible never talked about internet. So you know what? The internet's not a big deal to God. The Bible never talked about television. You're right. It didn't. But it talked about the principles that guide us in these ever-changing worlds. And so this is important for us to understand. And why? Because we're talking about things that are lost in translation. And we're going to go through some more of that today. But I want you to keep this in mind. And for those of you that know these verses or are familiar with some of these principles, I'm challenging you to let the Lord kind of revisit those. Again, because we talked about last week sort of this idea of the lost in translation of what repentance truly is and why we don't really live free when we repent because we're not following through the whole process of repentance. But today we're going to get even further into another important subject that we deal with on a daily basis. But let's look at a couple of other things that are lost in translation. And when I mean lost in translation, I'm not talking about necessarily misinterpreting the Greek or the Hebrew. In case you don't know, the Old Testament is written most is written in Hebrew. The New Testament is mostly written in Greek with a little bit of Aramaic sprinkled in, especially in the Gospels. So I'm not talking about our interpretation of Greek and Hebrew, even though there is some error in that we can find in Scripture that leads us down some wrong roads. I'm talking about more the idea, and we said it last week, and forgive me for using it again this week. I'm discussing more the idea that in England, if you said, if they said to you, can you put my luggage in the boot? If I'm an American, I'm over there trying to cram a suitcase into my size 12 
snow boot over there because they said put the luggage in the boot. And I said last week, the problem was to them, the boot is the trunk of the car. To me, the trunk of the car is the trunk of the car. But because the words get lost in translation, I'm trying to do something that's frustrating me. And again, back to that, is producing the wrong kind of fruit. And the problem is, isn't my boot. And the problem isn't the language. And the problem is, and wasn't what the person told me to do. The problem is my misinterpretation and lost in translation of the right words and the phrasing and understanding what really was being said. So we're going to challenge some things today. Some of you, I've already mentioned some of these before, but I, I want to go back to them a couple of times and we're going to get into this. And one of my favorite ones to talk about, because especially in the last couple of years, this has been one of the major verses that has been quoted. And that's Matthew, uh, Matthew 8. And I'm not going to read all of these fully. I would encourage you to go back and look at them. But this is one of the ones, man, this last couple of years, especially with COVID. This has been the verse, man. And this verse has a very important principle in it. It says, wherever two or three are gathered together in my name, I am in the midst. And man, that is the verse of all verses because that verse says right there that coming together is essential and if we don't come together, God's not in the midst. Now, let me establish this first and foremost. I'm going to put this on the board because I want you to know how serious I am about this because I think there's been some misunderstanding with some of the verbiage I've used in the past. I want to put this on the board. Coming together as the church is essential. I'll just put that there. Coming together is essential. I'm not arguing that today. The Bible is very clear about that. I put it on the board. It's official. Can't ever say I didn't say it. I said it and I wrote it. Coming together is essential. This is not an argument against coming together. However, the problem with this is this verse has nothing to do with us coming together as a church. Wherever two or three are gathered together in my name. I've, in fact, what's sad about this verse is and what's, what I, why I relate to it is because I've said it before. I've used it. I've been pastoring now for, oh, Lord Jesus, 14 years, full-time, 14 years, and I've been in ministry over 20, full-time for 20 years. I have led church gatherings, and I've used this verse, especially in the beginning, to say, everybody that's here, wherever two or three are gathered together in my name, that God would be in the midst, and look at all of us right now, we're, we're together, there's more than three of us here, so let's shout the name of Jesus, and everyone goes, Jesus! And see, he's here in the midst. The problem was that's not what the verse means. First of all, there's some major problems with that. Number one, it's, it's, it's really saying that if I'm by myself, God really can't be there, which we know is not true. Now, we're going to get into this later if we're able to get that far. Not today, but in the next couple weeks. Community and togetherness are essential. They're a part of the Christian experience. We can't, in fact, the, the Bible is very clear, and uh, you'll be hearing more about this in the next couple of months. The Bible is very clear. We don't walk this journey alone. It was built and designed to be walked in aspect of community. So I, I'd want to get that out there because I don't want you to think I'm contradicting myself. The point I'm trying to make is this. Here's the danger of this verse is because we've used it to say, see, wherever two or three are gathered together in my name, I'd be in the midst. We've used that and we've made it into this rah-rah rallying point to defend the fact that we need to come together, which coming together is important. It is essential. You cannot be the church and not come together. It doesn't define how you come together, but you've got to come together. We understand that. There's no argument to that. The Bible is full of the verses. The problem with this is because this verse has been used to that, the real power behind this verse has been lost in translation because this verse really, if you go read it, and if you don't think I'm right, feel free to go read Matthew 18. This verse really has to do with this word we don't like. This verse really is about how to handle conflict correctly. How to ha Oh, I got another word that this is about too. We don't like this one either. And I like to put these on the board so you can see them when I'm talking. Can't get them out of your mind. It's right there. It's visual. 
this verse really is talking about conflict and offense. And the Bible's saying here, and Jesus is really saying, if two or three brothers come together, and I don't mean brothers as far as only men, but if two or three come together with the purpose of bringing a resolution or the purpose of bringing together forgiveness and finding peace with one another, you're going to find me there in the midst. It's a promise by God that when you come together to have brotherly resolve to conflict, to bring peace, to forgive, and to love one another as Christ has loved us, he promised he would be there with us, giving us the grace to forgive when we don't want to forgive. So when you say, well, I just can't forgive, maybe the problem is you can't forgive is because you're trying to forgive in isolation. Maybe true forgiveness is going to come when you find a resolution and come together with that person you're for, you're you're offended with and come together and you say to them, I forgive you to their face. God's going to say, hold on, you're not going by yourself. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. Come on, somebody. Now your flesh doesn't like this. I know because your flesh wants to justify the reason why you don't ever forgive because it's too hard and you can't do it. And you know, forgiveness is just, oh, it's too much. But Jesus gives you the antidote to forgive. He said, if you go to forgive or you go to bring peace to a conflict, Guess what? You will not go alone because I'm going to be there in the midst. Now, that's a powerful verse. That, that verse brings hope. Now, again, like I said, it doesn't make it easy on our flesh because our flesh, no, 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 no. I was wronged and I'm going to be wronged. And until I get my vengeance, I'm not going to forgive. But our spirit man goes, okay, God, you're right. I, I can go if, if I know you're with me. I can go if I'm walking in your grace. I can go, God, if I'm walking in your strength. I can forgive. It's not easy in our flesh, but it, see the difference? That's what I'm talking about. You got to get this. The fruit of that is powerful. Because let's be honest with you. We've, I've clapped and jumped and ran around because two or three are gathered together by name. I'm in the midst from a worship gathering. But really, in the, in, in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't really bring fruit in my life. That interpretation, which is what God, what, what Jesus was really getting at, that brings fruit because it's going to bring peace. It's going to bring forgiveness. It's going to bring wholeness to the body of Christ. It's not going to let me sit and wallow my despair. It's not going to let me have an out and justify or the reason why I'm not letting go of things because he said, listen, if you go to forgive, if you go to bring peace, you're not going alone. I'm going to be there in the middle. Love that, right? Love it. Let's get a little further. We're getting in, we're going to get into some 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 stronger ones here that are more familiar. And I'm, I'm and some of these are, you may not agree with me at first, but I'm challenging you. Go back and read it. Here's another one. I love, this is a this is a bookstore classic. That's a new phrasing I have because in a, you know years ago I don't know if they have them. There's I thought I saw one the other day in our area, but very rare. Um, not just because it's Christian, but because most bookstores are going out of business. But Christian bookshops years ago were quite frequently around the area that we uh, that I live in. And man, you'd go in there and they would be filled with, you know, mug, coffee mugs and pictures and plaques and pens and t-shirts with all these Bible verses on it. And so the problem with that is I believe that they created a bookstore or a Christian bookstore theology because they used all these verses and they put them, and we're going to get into a couple more of these in a minute. These verses when they're spoken out of context, sound awesome, but you forget the context and you lose the power of the verse. And one of the ones that is often still used today is this one. And I guarantee you, if I put it up there, about half of you could quote it without even knowing it, just basically the fact it's Philippians 4.13. Go look at NFL on Sundays. You'll see somebody with eye paint with Philippians 4.13. They'll have it tattooed on their arm. They'll have it put on their cleat. Baseball players, basketball players, they use it. Because it says, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Which means I can dunk a basketball with Christ's strength. I can hit a home run because he gives me strength. I can score a touchdown because he gives me strength. I can smash the quarterback into the ground and hopefully break his leg. And knock him out of the game because I have the strength of Christ. <laughs> and we use that, right? So people now become that. I can take a test in school because I can do all things through Christ with strength in me. I can go to work and I can, I can accomplish this task in front of me because I can do all things through Christ with strength in me. And I'm not knocking that. But the problem is it's not what the verse was really talking about. In fact, if you don't believe me, 
let's go back and see here for a second what it really was saying. Philippians, let me pull it up here in my, in my Bible, Philippians 4. And we're going to read the entire context of this and find out if it was lost in translation. Let's go back to verse number eight. You ready? Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are a good report, if there be any virtue, if there be anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. What is he saying there? He's saying, if it brings fruit in your life, good fruit in your life, these are the things you should hold on to. There is Paul saying the fruit determines whether or not you should be meditating or chewing or, or, or thinking on these things. Verse number nine, the things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and God of peace will be with you. Now, here we go, ready? But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. Now I have, now, and I know how to be abased, and I know how to be abound. Everything and all things I have learned, both to be full of glory and to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What's the context of this verse for a second? The context of this verse is Paul's writing this verse while he's under house arrest, arrest facing charges of preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ with the very real possibility he's going to be put to death. That there is a potential that he will not make it out of this situation. He's facing things that are uncertain. He's facing things that don't look like the outcome is going to be in his favor. He's saying, I have learned how to be a bound, but I've learned how to be a base. Meaning, I've learned how to live on the mountain, but I've also learned how to survive in the valley. I've learned how to live in sunshine, but I've learned how to, how to live in rain. He said, I've learned how to be full, but I've also learned how to be hungry as well. And in this context, I can do all things through Christ which strengthen me. Meaning that whenever season, go back to it again. Let's look at it again in case you missed it. Go back up right here. I have learned, verse number 11, now that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. Meaning, whatever season I'm in, if it's a season of blessing, great. If it's a season of suffering, I got it. If it's a season of abundance, yes. If it's a season of need, yes. If it's a season I have more money and I can do whatever, you know, I can go take my family on vacation, great. Or if it's a season where I don't have two pennies to rub together, I have learned to be content. And because of this, I stand confident today that I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me, meaning it's not the ability for me to dunk a basketball, hit a home run, or to score a touchdown. It means that I have the ability through, through Christ to walk walk through anything because greater is he that is in me than the circumstances that I'm facing in this world. The strength and Philippians 4.13 is not a verse about your ability to achieve greatness. Philippians 4.13 is a verse that carries you through whatever state you're in. I got to slow down because I'm getting excited. So if you really want to know the power of I can do all things through Christ, that's not a verse you shout on the mountaintop. That's a, that's a verse you shout in the valley. Because you know, I can't make it on my own. I can't make it through this without him. I can do anything. I can do everything because it's him that provides the strength. Meaning, when I am weak, this is the same guy. Notice he's the same guy that said what? When I am weak, what? He is strong. Don't forget, in God, the way up, is down. That's the principle of scripture. We talked about a couple weeks ago, the inverted kingdom. This is the principle of the kingdom. The way up is down. And Paul says, when I am weak, he is strong. So you know in this verse, which is about what? What's the key word in this verse, right? Let's go back to this for a second. Forgive me for the whiteboard Sunday, but you know me, I can't pass up a good whiteboard. What's the key word that we love in Philippians 4.13? The key word we love in Philippians 
is 413 is this word. Because this is the word, baby. Strength. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. I'm going to flex my spiritual muscle because I'm strong. How are you in God? How are you strong? Ooh, see, you don't, we don't like some of these interpretations. We like it the old way because the, this way challenges us in ways our flesh doesn't like. Do you know how? So Philippians 4.13, the key word is strength, right? All things. I guess you could put all things. So I need to do all things. I can do all things. But the key word is I have strength. And it's strength. So it's like, boom, see, I can fly, I can dunk 360, touchdown, throw a pass, hit a home run, because I got strength. But see, what's the true key to strength? According to scripture, what's the key to strength? Oh boy. Oh boy, don't like that word. Can you please erase that word? I don't want, don't put that word on the whiteboard. Put a bunch of other words. Keep that word. No, no, everybody look up. Don't look there. Everybody look up. Strength is good. Weakness, that's so good. So what if the key to unlocking the power of Philippians 4.13, that you can do all things through Christ, the key to that verse, and I'm going to see if I can draw a little Pictionary key here. So the key it's like a bad game of Pictionary. The key to Philippians 4.13 and strength, the key does not come through putting that on a tattoo or putting it on your face or quoting that every day or putting it on your wall. The key through Philippians 4.13 is through weakness. So what if you say, God, I can do all things through you that strengthen me. So Father, today I pray for your strength. And God goes, okay, in order for you to get stronger, you got to get weaker. Whoa, 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 time out, time out, time out, get that, no, 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 erase that, no, 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 God, I asked for strength, hello, strength, God, I need strength, bring the strength, give me the strength, I need the strength, he said, I'll give you strength, here's how I'm going to give you strength, through weakness, because if you're weak, I can be strong, but if you're strong, what's that mean, right, it's the great ultimate paradox of the scale, right? You know, the old, an old school scale, right? If you got an old school scale and it's the old balance scales, right? Is you have this, uh, you have, and again, this is like a terrible game of hangman, but you have the old scale, right? That goes across. And whatever you put over here, if this goes down with weight, this side goes up. Because this thing right here is constantly moving because it's shifting, right? So it's on a it's on that it's on that that tipping point, and it's basically designed to go like this, right? So this is the scale of strength, right? In order to get strength on one side, I've got to accept weakness on my side. But if I want strength on my side and I keep strength, I'm making him weak. So if the true essence of this verse is that he is strong, the only path to strength in Christ is what? Weakness. That's not a good American word. That's not a good 21st century word. No, you can't be weak. You're empowered. You've got to be empowered. You've got to be strong. We've got to show the world we can do it. And maybe there is some merit to that, but there's a danger to that for us as believers because the more we think we can, the less he can. But the less we think we're able, the more he can do. So he said, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me because I am weak. He didn't say that, but that's what was in there. So Philippians 4.13 has been lost in translation because we're all quoting how strong we are and that's why we can't seem to see any fruit in our life because our strength has become our weakness when really it's our weakness that God brings strength. So you got to be careful. This is why the fruit of that. Again, look at the fruit, right? The fruit. I can do all things through Christ and we're running around flexing our muscle and not seeing anything happen because God can't bless those efforts because it's in our effort, our strength. We're wanting God to give us strength 
and God to be the supplier and we be the producer so we get the glory. And God said, no, it doesn't work that way. You can do all things through me. So if you're gonna, if things are gonna get done, it's gonna have to come through me because I'm your strength because you're too weak. So reality, that verse, to pray that verse is God, I can't do this. I don't know how to do it. I was praying this the other day and, and I was telling the Lord in a situation, I said to the Lord, I said, Lord, I don't know how to do this. I need your help. And I was praying sincerely. I said, Lord, I don't know how to do this. I need your help. Help me, Lord. And the Lord asked me, if you knew how to do it, would you still ask me? Those are one of those moments where God asks you a question that you just have to take a big, deep breath. Um, and there's no point of telling God. He already knows the answer. So you might as well not even try to lie or come up with a, come up with another alternative. And I'm praying, I mean, Lord, I don't know the answer to this. God, I need you to show me because I don't know the answer. And God said, if you knew the answer, would you still ask me? And I had to stop for a second because I thought, well, Lord, probably not. Because if I knew the answer, I would just do it. Because I don't need to know, I already know. He said, that's the problem. He said, the problem isn't the fact you're coming to me because you don't know the answer. The problem is you are relying on yourself when you know the answer. I want you to come to me no matter what. I want you to come to me whether you have the answer or you don't have the answer. I want you to come to me when you have the strength and you don't have the strength. I want you to ask me when you think you know, and I want to ask you when you don't know. I want to be the source of everything in you. That was one of those moments where you just have to take a moment peel yourself off the floor because God has just TKO'd you. I mean, I mean that's a, a, a Mike Tyson uppercut to the spiritual jaw. I'm knocked out, 10 count, I'm out. Because what can you say? And I had to repent and ask God to forgive me because it's true. Because I've spent my life, God, I don't know what to do, show me. But then when I do know what to do or I think I have the ability or the I know through my intellect what to do, God, I got it. And then when it goes south, God, you know, clean my mess up because I, you know, somehow I missed it. And God's like, wait a minute. The true essence of who I am in your life is you come to me no matter what. And you come to me and you say, God, I know what to do. But Paul said it. Everything that's been gained in me, I count as lost that I might win Christ. So God, even if I know what to do, it's no good because it's not what you want to do. And if you want to do something that's contrary to my intellect or my ability, then by your grace, I do those things. This is why this is important. So I can do all things through Christ. That's not talking just about the things that I don't, that I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do, but I can do it because Christ is in me. No, true essence of Philippians 4.13, and I can't get past this. Man, I got other stuff I want to get to today. If we might have, This might be a 12-part series if we keep going at this pace. The true essence of Philippians 4.13 is not when you don't know what to do. The true essence of Philippians 4.13 is this word. Oh, that doesn't leave anything out. That means you can do all things, meaning the things you don't know how to do, but the things you do know how to do. Ooh, somebody needs to hear this. I don't know why I'm on this point because somebody needs to hear hear me. We love that verse when we don't know what to do, but the power of that verse when we don't know, but the true power and locking the power and the fruit behind that verse is when you do know what to do, you say, God, all things, I can do all things through you that gives me strength. So sometimes my lack weakens me, but sometimes I have to humble myself even in my abundance. Paul said, I've learned how to bound and I've learned how to abase. What is he meaning by that? Meaning he's learned how to rely on God when he had nothing, but more importantly, he's learned how to rely on God when he had everything. Oh my Lord, help us today. I feel some revelation. Somebody needs to hear what I'm saying. We love to talk about what we do when we know it don't know what to do, but the true essence of what God's trying to do is what do you do when you know what to do? That's why Paul said, when I was up on the mountaintop or in the valley, I've learned how, whatever state, to go, I can do all things through you. Because he said, wait a minute, when I'm on the, in the valley, it's easy to say, God, I need you, but I've learned even on the mountaintop, God, I need you. I've learned when I'm hungry, you're my source. But I've also learned when I've had plenty of food and food to throw away and I'm taking food home and put it in the refrigerator for later, 
I need you. And that's why he said, I can do all things. It didn't mean only that I can do. I can do the things that I don't know what to do because he gives me strength. No, he said, I can do all things, meaning the things I know and the things I don't know. And the greatest power behind the strength of Jesus Christ is not in the areas we don't know. It's in the areas that we do know that we learn how to be abound and how to be a base. We've learned how to be strong in our weakness, but we've also learned how to be weak in our strength. Mm. Oh, I got to say that again. I got to say it again. There it is right there. Someone needs to hear me right there. Listen to what the Holy Ghost saying. We have to learn how to be strong in our weakness because he's our strength. But we need to learn how to be weak in our strength. Mm. I got to say it one more time because some of you, it just it's flown by you twice. We're going to hit it again. This train's circling back around one more time. You need to learn how to be strong in your weakness. But the greatest power that we can display in our Christian journey as being disciples of Jesus Christ is learning how to be weak in our strength. Joel Wright has done a terrible job at that because Joel Wright loves to rely on Joel Wright. I love to figure things out. I love to, I'm a, I'm a learner. I'm, I'm always learning. Ask my family. I'm always reading something, wa you know, learning, watching a documentary. I mean, I'll, I've, I, I, I am the king of useless information half the time because I, I've, I've studied so many subjects and have a somewhat working knowledge of so many things. And, and because I just have a fascination to learn. I mean, I've studied my wife will laugh at me. She's like, how do you know that? I'm like, I don't know. I remember reading it somewhere one time. It just, I, I just love to read and learn stuff. The problem with that is the more I put in me, the more I have strength, which in situations I go, okay, God, I got it. I got it. I got it. So the challenge is this, and I, I want to say this to somebody today in the Holy Ghost. If I was walking into a, let's, let's go to our jobs because this is real world living, right? Let's talk about how it applies to us today. If I was walking into a job that I didn't know, I wasn't qualified for, you'd be, oh God, help me today, Lord. I, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to do this job. So Lord, I need your strength today. I need your grace. Work Work, Father, show me the way. You know, we'd be up at four in the morning to get to work by eight because we'd be spending three hours begging and asking God to help you because you know if you don't, he doesn't help you, you're going to fail this job. But what about those of you that are skilled at what you do? Some of you that are watching today are very skilled. We have people that are in the technology field that are brilliant successful. We have business owners that are watching today. We have people that are in construction. We have people that are in real estate. We have people that are in, 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 in white collar jobs. We have people successful in blue collar jobs that are watching today and that have spent years and effort and time perfecting and acquiring skill and are very intelligent. For you that are there, that, that group, when's the last time you put your skill before God. When's the last time you put all of your <clears throat> training and your human understanding and all the things you've acquired on the and put it on the altar and say, God, even though I think I know what to do, I can't do anything without your strength. Maybe you've grown a successful business. Maybe you're attempting to grow a business and it's growing and you're having success and you get up every day and you've read, you know, every book under the sun, every business book and you're practicing and, and, and perfectly applying every single business principle you know. And I mean, it's just blowing up and you're just, I mean, you it's happening and you're like, I got this. And you get up and you give God a token. God, I need you today, God, you know, but you go about your day because you're skilled in that area. That's what Philippians 4.13 is talking to. He's talking to that group because he said, I can do all things, not the hard things or the things I'm not skilled. I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. We have tremendous people watching today, part of Antioch West, and maybe some of you that are watching, I don't know who you are, and you're tremendous at what you do. We have nurses on here. We have people in the medical field. We have people that work in administration and are highly skilled, all that do tremendous jobs, very skilled and work their way up through 
their job and are very, very uh, 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 influential and have people relying on them and have become the leaders of their division or become bosses in certain areas. And, and we've had people in government that have worked their way up and tremendously skilled, awesome people that are watching today. Awesome. I'm not saying God wants you to be, I, I don't think God, I'm not saying God wants you just to be a, 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 some kind of bump on the log. I'm challenging you that know what to do. If you really want to truly be a disciple of Jesus Christ, if you really truly want to apprehend him, you've got to learn how to live in want, but you've got to have to, have to learn how to live in abundance. My wife and I were talking the other day, and uh, we were talking about something, and I said, you know what? I, it's harder to live with blessing than it is to live with nothing. Now, every one of you that's living with nothing, you go, yeah, right. Well, you, I would love to live with abundance. No, you see, the problem is Israel had spent 40 years, 40 years. That's a whiteboard number, by the way. I need to put that up on the whiteboard. If I can get my top off here. That's a whiteboard number. Let's put that up there. I'm not going to get to the rest of my notes today. Jesus is just sticking us right here. We're going to stay right here. This is challenging for the day. We got more to go. It might be, this might be a 17 week series. 40 years. Think about that. 40 years. They lived in need. Every day they had to get up, and every day they had to rely on this stuff called manna. Manna was on the ground every day, except on the Sabbath. And so on the day before the Sabbath, God sent a double portion. But every day they had to get up knowing that if the manna wasn't there, they wouldn't eat. They lived in need, constant need. They didn't have places to go and to produce clothes and shoes. So... For 40 years, God said, your clothes and your shoes won't wear out. I'll be your source. You won't have to go buy new shoes. You won't have to make new clothes. I'll be that. For 40 years, they circled around the desert, the wilderness, as nomads with no home, moving from place to place as God led them. And even their relationship with God was based off need because they had a temple they built a tabernacle in, the, in, in, in Moses. God gave Moses instruction to build a tabernacle and they had experiences with God, but all of it was based upon this simple principle. They were living. They were living in need. But here's the danger. God said, you're going to go to the promised land. You're going to cross over to the other side. That was the, the promise God gave to the Israelites when they left Egypt, right? They were in Egypt, slaves, 400 years. Moses shows up. I'm giving you the very short version of the story. Moses shows up, has this conflict with Pharaoh, 10 plagues later, and the death of, of the firstborn sons of Egypt. Pharaoh let the people go. They go to the Red Sea. Part it, they cross over, Pharaoh chases, no more Pharaoh, God's instant wiping out of Pharaoh's army. They get to the banks of the promised land, they look across, send some spies, come back saying, no, it's not, not, not going to work out. So God, in his desire to, pur pur to purge Israel of their doubt and unbelief, had them circle for 40 years. 40 years. And then he says to them, after getting them out of slavery, 400 years of bondage, he has them leave without ever having to fire a single shot. I know you're like, well, there's no guns back then. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a saying. 400 years of slavery, they got to be free and become their own people without having to fire a single shot. No war. None of their sons spilling their blood on the Egyptian battlefields. And on top of that, God eliminated their enemy without them having to ever do anything. They spent 40 years seeing a daily miracle, on, not, not including the other miracles that they saw. 
Don't forget, this is a period of time where Moses came down from the mountain with tablets that God had actually written with his own finger. This was stuff that they were, this is the kind of stuff they were experiencing. And all that, for 40 years, they had seen God and they had lived in need and they had lived with this amazing experience with God. And then God says, you're going to cross over to the other side finally. And you're going to live in the promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey, a land flowing with abundance. You're going to live in houses you didn't fee- uh, build. You're going you're gonna to reap from, from fields you didn't plow. And when you get on over there, here's what I I'm asking you to do and I'm warning you don't forget me what do you mean forget you God you're the source of all this I mean my goodness you're the source of all this I mean I've been living in a tent sleeping on a rock for the last 40 years eating the same food every day when I get over there I got milk and I've got honey and I've got animals and I'm just living it up of course God I'm gonna know it's you he said no 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 wait he said, don't forget me when you get over there and you're living in abundance. I don't have a problem with you. Live with you. I don't have to worry about you forgetting me when you're in need. I have to worry, are you going to forget me in abundance? And one of the craziest verses in the Bible, it says, after they had crossed over and they lived in the promised land and God had shown them victory after victory and so many amazing things that happened, this is what was said of them. It said there arose a generation in Israel that knew not God. They didn't know God. Four years of miracles. Escaping out of Egypt. Miracles. Crossing over the Jordan. Defeating Jericho. Walls crumbling. This ragtag group of nomads becoming a force, fighting force that no one had ever seen in that area. Conquering all that. And when it all said done and they're living in houses they didn't build and plowing and reaping from fields and vineyards they hadn't tended and plowed and dug, there arose a generation that knew not God. Can I tell you the key part of Philippians 4.13, and I did not intend to do this. This actually wasn't even in the notes, but it was in Jesus' notes today. Can I say to you some of you today? When you, when you don't feel well in your body, when you're sick, when you're dealing with things in your body, you got pain every day, it's easy to get up and go, God, I need you today. God, I need your strength today. Can't make it without you. But the moment you get healthy, I know I'm talking to somebody right now. The moment you start getting healthy, you stop praying. You stop asking God. God, I got it. Thank you. My body feels good. I'm strong. Medication is starting to work. God, this medication is not working. I need your help. Boo, look at that. The medication's working. Thank you, Jesus. Off without it. That's the danger. So what does God do in his, in, what does God do in order to be merciful to you and I? He keeps us in a constant constant state of need. Do you know the Bible is a Bible of, that book, the Bible is a, is a book of blessing, of peace. And I believe the Bible is a book of prosperity. Maybe not always with dollar signs. But here's the danger of that. Why don't we see more of that? Because we, Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ because I don't know how to do this. But if I had the money, it's one thing to ask God, how to spend money you don't have. But it's another thing when you ask God to spend the money you do have. God, I don't have money to pay this bill. I need you to supply it. But it's another thing when you said, God, I have money to go on this vacation, but do you want me to spend this money on this vacation? That's what Paul's getting at. You see, that's the challenge for all of us. And I didn't mean to get here, but the Lord's trying to challenge somebody. They didn't feel it in the Holy Ghost. And some of you, your, your flesh does not want to hear this. If you don't find God in your strengths, and if you don't learn how to be weak in your strengths, God's going to keep you constantly in a place of need. It may not be in one area. For one, it might be financial. For the other, it might be relational. For one, it might be their job. For another one, it might be uh, health. But God will constantly keep something in your life to make you live in a place of need. You see, when you get like Paul, you find, you know what, if I'm if I'm blessed or if I'm in want. 
Whatever state I'm in, I'm learn to be content because my state doesn't determine my need for him. I need him to do all things. I need his strength every day. So I'm not, I don't have to live in need to ask him. And I don't, I've learned even in abundance to still ask him. Lost in translation. So can I challenge someone today in the Holy Ghost? When you go to work tomorrow and you you are awesome at your job. I mean, you're so good. They're talking about how they can pay you more and promote you more. And you walk in there because you're just the, you're just the, the, I mean, you just, you just got it going on. I mean, you walk in there to your job and you got the, you got the swag and you sit down at your desk and you're like, yep, what up? I'm here. Before you go in there, why don't you humble yourself and say, God, I'm good at my job. I'm skilled at what I do, but I know the only reason that comes is because you're the source. And so, Lord, today, even though I know how to do my job, even though I'm good at what I do, I'm asking you, Lord, to be my strength today. Because I know even if I know what to do, I still don't know what to do because I want to do what you want me to do. You know the true essence of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but I want to circle back around to this point. The true essence of being a disciple of Jesus Christ is, let's say you're a plumber. I'll just use that as a good kind of, a good nondescript job in this context. Not saying that plumber's not important, but it's a good sort of relatable job across the board. So if you're a plumber, you see, we, I, we think of being a plumber in the context of, our journey with God is God wants me to be the best plumber I can be. He wants me to be the most successful and prosperous plumber. So I'm going in there and I'm going to work and I'm going to learn how to be a plumber and I'm going to learn all the skills of the trade so I can be the best I can be. The true essence of discipleship is not to be the best plumber I can be, but the true essence of being a disciple is what kind of plumber would Jesus be? What kind of plumber would Jesus be? If Jesus was a plumber, how would he be? Would Jesus be a plumber? Would he would he treat people in the job? Would he how would he treat people in the job? How would he treat his customers? If Jesus was a plumber, how would he interact with the world around him? You see, when you do it that way, it changes the context of what it means to be great at something. If Jesus was the boss at your company like you are, what kind of boss would he be? If Jesus was the employee at your company like you were, what kind of employee would he be? If Jesus sold cars, what kind of car salesman would he be? If Jesus was an administrator, what kind of administrator would he be? That's the true essence we have to ask ourselves every day in everything we're doing. If Jesus, if Jesus went to Walmart, what kind of person would he be in Walmart? Oh, that's being silly. No, we're being formed and shaped in the image of Christ. Well, what other way is there to look at it? And if when you look at it that way, you realize no matter how good you are at something, you fall short because you're ultimately trying to be like Christ. Look at what it said. Go back to it. It says here, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What's the second key word in that verse? Strengthens the first thing, right? We talk about all things. What's the other word? Christ. To be like him. I can't do that on my own. So it's not like I want to be like him just when I come to church or I'll be like him spiritually. No. What kind of business owner would Jesus be? What kind of employee would Jesus be? What kind of, what kind of student would Jesus be? What kind of person in Walmart would Jesus be? What kind of person would Jesus be at the gas station? What kind of person would Jesus be at the gym? What kind of person would Jesus be when he when you went to the interacted with your neighbor? When you do that, it doesn't matter how strong you are, you realize you're weak because I can't be Christ-like without his strength. Father, I pray today by your grace, I have tried to obey you. You ultimately ultimately had what was to be said here today. And I've tried to follow that. But Lord, this is not just words that are coming from Joel. I believe you're speaking to us. You're challenging us today. 
And Father, I speak today, a spirit of revelation would come to us and we would accept this challenge and that we would find a way that we would find you even in our strengths. We know how to find you in our weaknesses, but the greatest challenge today that we face is how to find you in our strengths. But that only comes by grace and revelation and understanding that we can't do anything without you. The things we can do and the things we can't, can't do, but more importantly, the things we can do have to come by you. So Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you would show us you, your way, that we can be, we, we can be transformed into your image and be like you. Lord, when I go to work tomorrow, I don't want to go to work as Joel Wright. I want to go to work as the, as the person you would be at my job. That's what I want to be. I pray these things today. We receive these things today. We walk in these things today in Jesus' name. God bless you. Thank you for joining us today. And I pray, as always, that you're challenged by what you heard. Come back and be with us. We're in this vein. God's doing some awesome things. There's such a great spirit of revelation. I hope you're seeing this and feeling this as much as I am. But not only that, it's not just good. I hope you're taking it and applying it into your life as God leads you in Jesus' name.